I'm always surprised when when people say no or or are taking a kind of hand on hip attitude about something new, whether it's a piece of not technology or a piece of art that's just doing something mm. different. Um, that that always surprises me, and I I would never want to be perceived that way as someone who's static. Right. You know, because that's. You know, there's that's unnatural. It's actually stasis is an unnatural form of being, because nothing in this universe is static. You know, mm. everything is moving forward. Hi everyone, I'm Dom Griffin. I'm a film critic, and you're watching the Armchair Auteur. This is an ongoing video series I do where we talk about new movies, old movies, screenplay analysis, television series reviews, that sort of thing. So, if you like movies, you like movie adjacent popular culture, and you like to see someone pick those things apart, you're in the right place, and you should consider subscribing. Today, I want to talk about Kimmy, Steven Soderbergh's latest feature film effort, and exclusive on the HBO Max platform that is so much more important than most people seem to be giving it credit for. In the week leading up to the film's release on the streaming platform, Soderbergh was the latest in a long line of directors to get put up on the Summer Jam screen by the fandom industrial complex for saying he didn't think he could ever make a superhero movie. In context, his remarks are obviously more nuanced, but the pull quote every website with a cape in its masthead ran with was his complaint that nobody is fucking. This sensationalized take of course attracted a lot of ire and discourse, largely from folks highlighting Chloe Zhao's infamous sex scene from Eternals. But in all the hubbub around that detail, folks overlooked the more telling part of the interview. Soderbergh actually said, The fantasy spectacle universe, as far as I can tell, typically doesn't involve a lot of fucking, and also things like, who's paying these people? Who do they work for? How does this job come to be? So yes, superheroes don't fuck, but neither do most people in modern mainstream movies. But they also, for the most part, do not work. Not in the traditional sense, anyway. They don't work because superhero films, by and large, are not interested in exploring superheroics as labor, as an activity exercised in the pursuit of making income in order to exist. Though these movies are extremely capitalistic endeavors, they do not engage with the experience of existing in a capitalist society, something literally every other Steven Soderbergh movie wrestles with, one way or the other. Soderbergh, not unlike Michael Mann, is a guy who makes movies about what people do and how they exist within the real world. I've often said to friends that there's really only two kinds of people in this world. People have to worry about paying the rent, and people who don't. Generally speaking, even Soderbergh movies about the latter exist in the same world as the former, and I think that's an important distinction. Which brings us to Kimmy. Written by Jurassic Park and Panic Room scribe David Kep, the film follows Zoe Kravitz as Angela Childs, an agoraphobic tech worker in Seattle during the COVID-19 pandemic we are still actively living through. She works for a company called Amygdala, monitoring the voice recordings from an Alexa-esque device called Kimmy, a digital assistant whose creation requires actual humans to decipher and improve the interactions between the user and itself. Hey Kimmy. I'm here. You're a pecker. I don't know what you mean by, you're a Packerwood. On a routine day of clearing her queue, she stumbles onto a piece of audio that doesn't fit in with the rest of the batch. What Angela hears sounds, to her, like a sexual assault, but turns out to be a murder. Unbeknownst to Angela, it's a crime related to Amygdala's upcoming IPO, where the company's CEO stands to become a very rich man. So when she must overcome her debilitating anxiety to leave the house and get these recordings to someone in the company who can liaison with the FBI, her journey is fraught with men tasked with silencing her and taking her off the board. From the premise alone, I'm sure you can tell this film borrows influence from Rear Window, Blow Up, and Blow Out, and Kep's own Panic Room. But because this is a Steven Soderbergh joint, it also feels very squarely his own. It's a lean, efficient picture that marries the relative structure and mechanics of a Hitchcock thriller to something that feels decidedly modern without getting too cute about our current social, technological, and financial predicaments. Did I mention it's also 89 minutes long? Now, I understand that on paper this sounds like something that is deeply missable. I imagine that is the same reason why so few people are talking about the film online, or anywhere really. But before I get into the world of streaming first movies and their interchangeable white noise effect, I do want to talk about how Kimmy stands out from the rest of the pack. Compare Kimmy to a similar recent picture, Netflix's Atrocious Woman in the Window adaptation. That's a film you certainly don't remember even if you have seen it. I have, and I had to literally rewatch the video I made about it to recall why I didn't even like it. It's a film that tries to wear its influences proudly on its sleeve while failing to even meet the bog standard expectation of keeping a viewer engaged through its runtime. But Kimmy is something else entirely. Any cook that talks to you about the best way to make a specific dish, they always highlight how important it is to have the best, freshest ingredients, because that's what makes or breaks whether or not a dish can come together perfectly. At a very basic level, Kimmy is a film whose individual, disparate creative elements are all operating at a higher tier 
appear on their own. I'd never gotten into the gender-bent television adaptation of High Fidelity, so for me, this is my first time seeing Zoe Kravitz playing a role where she feels like a true star. So much of the film centers around her performance, to the point that any lesser on-screen work would probably hobble the picture around it. Angela, as a protagonist, could most charitably be described as prickly, as Kravitz is able to consistently ground her foibles in a way that still allows the audience to root for and worry about her. I especially love her physicality in this role, and the little ticks she gives Angela that reappear throughout the runtime. Kimmy? I'm here. Open next stream on desktop. Though Kravitz is the main attraction, the supporting cast is also aces. Soderbergh continues his fun tradition of casting comedic actors in clutch background turns, like Andy Daly as a put-upon supervisor who is tired of taking Zoom meetings with his kids at home and wants nothing to do with a potential murder mystery. Don't send me anything like this ever again, please. Hey, you guys, I swear to God, you are driving me insane! I'm going to take everything you love and put it in a garbage bag. Or David Wayne is Angela's concerned dentist. Angela, your gum is swollen and inflamed with red streaks. You may have an abscess. But it's Rita Wilson who steals the show. I hadn't thought about Rita Wilson in real life for a very long time as anything other than Tom Hanks' wife and Chet Hanks' mother. Respect, you don't know. Here, though, she taps into a similar space as Jonathan Groff in The Matrix Resurrections, a misleading signifier of the neoliberal workplace supervisor who has all the softness and proper nomenclature to imply sincerity and earnestness, despite masking malice and an unending fealty to the machine. She's just really fucking good. Kep's sturdy, reliable screenwriting is a boon here, keeping the story propulsive but never aggressively so, still allowing room for patient character drama even housed within this thriller plot. His approach only falters for me in a pair of scenes where characters have to act willfully ignorant for the sake of a scene, like Angela being surprised some employment terms and conditions she signed were hiding pernicious intent. I never gave you guys a retinal scan. Sorry. Downstairs there was a retinal scanner at the door and it let me in, but I never sat for a scan. Well, we take them off the video conferences. It's faster. But I didn't get permission. Sure you did. It's in the terms and conditions of the conference software. Nobody reads those. There can't be anything in that agreement that allows a company to do what they're talking about to Kyle. Hold up, here it is right here. In another moment where one of the film's villains is asking where some original files are being kept when he is literally standing six feet away from whole ass computers he hasn't even attempted to look through. But aside from Cliff Martinez's killer score, the real MVP is obviously cinematographer, editor, director Soderbergh, who remains one of my favorite talents to watch work. I came here to make one thing fucking clear. I'm a no secret if you're not into the channel that it has been some time since I uploaded a new video and that for some factors that I don't want to get into here it has been harder for me to put out new work and it's left me more introspective than usual. In that introspection I finally figured out what it is I like so much about Soderbergh's work. I'm someone who in all areas of my life seek to resolve conflict and to solve problems. That is like my main mode in this world. Be they professional, personal, whatever. I like to resolve conflict and solve problems. When I'm on, I feel exceptionally good at doing that. I feel great about it. And when I'm not, I struggle to accomplish the basic task of putting on pants at the beginning of the day. I used to think I liked Soderbergh so much because I was jealous of his work ethic. Since returning from his temporary retirement, he's stayed so busy, and every year he releases a master list of what he's watched, read, and consumed in a given year, and his consumption habits seem unreal for a man who also seems to direct two whole feature films annually. It's not just that he stays booked and busy. It's not just that he's so prolific. It's not just that he has such a varied body of work. It's that he's a problem solver. It's that he approaches every new story like it's an equation to solve, shifting his perspective and technique for whatever the material requires. For Kimmy, that means employing a lot of his usual touchstones, like the use of natural light and his reliable obsession with depicting process on screen. Echoing back to what we talked about earlier with his focus on labor and workers and what they do being grounded in a tangible world, this movie, existing within the tech space and commenting on its exponential encroachment into our daily lives, focuses a lot on the imagery of the devices we use to get things done. In some cases, this means we get to see the wizard behind the curtain of Amygdala's CEO conducting a televised interview from his garage with a shoddy work-from-home setup familiar to many from the last couple of years of COVID. It also means we can play the fun guessing game of who is a bad guy based on whether or not they have access to Apple products on screen. <laughs> I feel great. I've been saying since I was brought in two years ago, Kimmy is the future of this company. Judy, you still 
there. Even basic things like the way text messages are handled on screen, with green and blue bubbles drifting between Angela and her strange love interest buildings like paper airplanes in the sky stand out as integrating modernity on screen without making it feel weird. So many filmmakers are obsessed these days with making period pieces and turning the clock back so that they can tell stories that are completely unfettered by modern entanglements like social media, smartphones, and the like. Because they feel like engaging with modern technology can be distracting as it moves faster every single year such that even a close-up of a smartphone can make a movie feel extremely dated only four or five years later from its release. But I love that Soderbergh isn't afraid to actually wrestle with the world we currently live in, not always retreating to the past to avoid some of the more difficult things to depict on screen. Though this very much feels like 2022 Soderbergh homaging 1950s Hitchcock, more contemporary influences are on display too, like this very Fincher-esque focus on little informational details. This being a movie that doesn't shy away from occurring during the pandemic, many of the plot points set up for a thriller about an agoraphobe on paper end up taking on extra thematic weight in the context of our current global predicament. The canted angles of Angela's first steps outside of her apartment building are obviously meant to dramatize the anxiety she feels, but they double as a tragicomic commentary on how a lot of people, even those who didn't previously struggle with agoraphobia, feel about going outdoors. A set piece placed within a local protest doesn't sit with the setting long enough to make any half-hearted observations about the many live demonstrations of the past few years, but they nonetheless ground a fantastical conspiracy thriller into the here and now. Even the crowd's chants? begin to feel like some kind of poetry about how technology and passive surveillance have made us prisoners to big tech, even in our own daily lives. But that's not some Charlie Brooker galaxy brain agitprop on display. It's just what happens when fun pop thriller elements happen to dovetail with the loose themes by chance, instead of employing ham-fisted and obvious metaphors that elicit eye rolls. Which brings me to what makes Kimmy so unique. Streaming originals are nothing burger movies. I reviewed so many on this channel, on Netflix, on Hulu, on Disney+, and 90% of the time, they're utterly forgettable works. They don't so much feel like real movies as much as half thought out concepts an algorithm decided would eventually make a nice thumbnail for someone to click on when they're scrolling late at night by themselves. Because the only movies in the theatrical marketplace that are getting made on a regular basis are low-budget horror thrillers, big-budget superhero tentpole movies, and the occasional animated family film, there's no longer as much room as every person you know on film Twitter likes to lament for the mid-budgeted adult movie aimed at adults. There's no room for romance, there's no room for quiet dramas, there's no room for the legal thriller, there's no room for these other things. They used to be so commonplace back in the 90s. And a lot of the people who used to watch these movies, and a lot of the people who used to make these movies, have given up the good fight and moved on to prestige television, Steven Soderbergh remains in this space, and even though he's making movies for the streaming platforms, he's still making real movies. He's embraced and accepted this new normal, he's not treating it like the end times. The sky isn't falling for Steven Soderbergh, he's still trucking along. And this shouldn't be surprising for a guy who's always been such a forward-thinking problem solver. All the way back in 2005, Mark Cuban had come to acquire three separate business entities he wanted to cult together for a new film releasing strategy. He owned Magnolia Home Releasing for DVD distribution, HDNet for high definition VOD, and Landmark Theaters, the nation's largest art house exhibition chain. His goal was to make low budget films that would be released day and date on DVD, premium home VOD, and theaters at the same time a then unheard of strategy that was mocked and ridiculed. Soderbergh entered into a six picture deal to produce features for this venture, seeing it as fertile ground for experimentation. He only ended up releasing two films in this vein. The 2006 murder mystery Bubble, shot for a million dollars on digital video using non-professional actors, and 2009's The Girlfriend Experience. The former, though an underrated film, was easily forgotten and failed to make even a hint of a dent into the cultural landscape, though The Girlfriend Experience fared better, perhaps due to the built-in marketing narrative of starring then-porn star Sasha Gray. It would go on to inspire the star's television spinoff of the same name. But ever since returning from retirement and the relative financial failure of 2017's Logan Lucky in theaters, Soderbergh has seemingly returned to the creative space born of that unique period of his career. He's released six feature films in the last five years, all but one of which have been for a streaming platform. The iPhone shot High Flying Bird. They invented a game on top of a game in the laundromat were both for Netflix, but he's back to his often home at Warner Brothers now with an ongoing deal to produce movies directly for HBO Max, a platform plenty of filmmakers criticize for its choice of releasing movies day and date during the pandemic. 
and not just weird little indie movies starring porn stars, but big budget blockbusters as well. Christopher Nolan famously criticized HBO Max and Warner Brothers' decision to spite filmmakers to release movies that are meant for theatrical consumption to viewers at home and to use it to bloat their stock prices and things. He claimed Warner Brothers was no longer the film-centric haven it once was. And maybe if you're the kind of guy who needs to make $200 million event pictures that have to be shown on an IMAX screen to have maximum efficacy, then yeah, Warner Brothers is probably not for you anymore. Have fun at Universal. But for someone as nimble and flexible as Steven Soderbergh, it feels like the place to be. In the last half decade, Soderbergh has been consistently cranking out interesting, engaging, and thought-provoking films on a smaller scale, all with fantastic casts, strong film craft, and a dedication to approaching storytelling from new and invigorating angles. He doesn't see himself as churning out forgettable content for the vaporware grist mill of the streaming world, but as a storyteller who can see the shape and scope of the industry shifting, who is willing to bend and adapt in order to keep doing what he does best. For some, these little streaming pictures are all minor Soderbergh. They don't have the universal appeal of the Oceans movies, nor the built-in gravitas of his Che Guevara epic. But for my money, his most fascinating work has always been these little pictures he makes in between the bigger swings. They're the kind of movies we used to see a lot more of in the theatrical space, but they're no less enjoyable at home on a reasonably sized television. Right now, he's the only guy consistently making good to great movies in the streaming space, and not just throwing his weight around to get money from Netflix or Apple to invest in a big budget whale that'll only get two or three weeks in theaters as a vanity accommodation. While I don't want anyone to give up the fight entirely of keeping more interesting and smaller budgeted fare in the theatrical world, I do think that more filmmakers should actually embrace streaming platforms the way Steven Soderbergh has. Because if more people stop treating it like the ghetto of film releasing and start acknowledging the people that want to watch movies at home, especially in this new normal we find ourselves in, those people deserve good movies too. More of the movies that are being pushed to us on our tablets and smart TVs and phones will be real actual movies that people can really enjoy, not just clickable thumbnails with empty productions behind them. It would be beautiful to live in a world where more of the streaming platform original features we watch have the same level of care, consistency, and creativity as Kimmy. But in the meantime, if you're sick to death of the repetitive, unoriginal garbage Netflix calls original content, give HBO Max a try. They've got a pretty damn good library, a mixture of new and older films, a lot of really great TV shows from HBO, and Steven Soderbergh is already hard at work on a third Magic Mike film exclusive to the platform. And by the time that comes out, he's probably already going to be in post-production on another feature that he's working on that we haven't even heard of yet. Because that man never sleeps. I'm just glad we're lucky enough to live in a world where he keeps getting to make movies and we keep getting to watch them. Even if I have to watch them from my couch and not a theater seat. Those are my thoughts about Kimmy and Steven Soderbergh and streaming platform movies in general. If you haven't seen Kimmy yet, please I would say run out to watch it, but you can do so from home. From home, Open up the app, give it a shot. It's a really fantastic film, and I don't think you're going to end up leaving disappointed. Thank you again for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts about Steven Soderbergh, about Kimmy, about streamers, about society, I don't know, whatever, you can do so in the comments below. Uh, I love talking to you guys, and if you have not subscribed, this would be a great time to subscribe. Hit the little bell icon so you get notifications when I put out new videos. Thank you again for watching. Hope everyone's doing well, staying safe, being good to yourselves and each other. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Kimmy, 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 Kimm